buenos dias. Um, <laughs> so are you going to, you're going to tell us a bit about what's front of your mind in this space in relation to the work of our Privacy Commissioner, the Information Commissioner's, um, sorry, no, Ofcom, <laughs> the, <laughs> the key body. <laughs> the workload that Ofcom has ahead of it is mind-blowing. The Act only finally became law last week. A lot of people's hopes and aspirations are riding on Ofcom's implementation. So we're, I, I, at least, and I'm sure everybody else, is very keen to hear what you've got to say. Great, thank you. I've got some slides, so I'll just share my screen. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yep, you're up now. Got it. <laughs> Great. So my name is Carmen Hernandez. I'm a policy analyst in the Age Assurance Policy Team at Ofcom. And I'm here today to talk to you about Age Assurance specifically. But if you are interested in our general approach to the Online Safety Bill more generally, we have recently published a document on our approach. We published that last week. Um, so you can find that on the website. So last Thursday, the Online Safety Act received royal assent, and on that day, Ofcom officially assumed its new role as the UK's online safety regulator. However, our regulation in this space actually started a few years earlier. So we are already the regulator for the video sharing platform regime in the UK. The regime started off as a European law, but it was transposed into UK law in November 2020. So the scope of the VSP regime is much narrower than the Online Safety Act, as it only applies to UK established video sharing platforms. So currently there's actually only 20 notified VSPs, and these include TikTok and OnlyFans. So in 2021, Ofcom published its Harms and Measures Guidance, and this was intended to assist services with complying with the VSP framework including the requirement that VSPs that have pornographic content on their platform should have robust access controls that verify age and prevent under 18s from accessing this content. So in the guidance, we set out measures that we would not consider to be robust age assurance in this context. And this included self-declaration of age, as well as debit cards and other cards where the user isn't required to be 18 as well as general disclaimers asserting that all users should be over the age of 18. We also set out factors that we would take into account when determining if a VSP specialises in pornography, as these are the services that are prioritised for this requirement. And these factors included how much pornography is on the service, as well as the significance of pornography to that service. Given its smaller scope, the VSP program has been a real learning opportunity to help ourselves prepare for the Online Safety Act, as well as enabling us to build an evidence base on the current age assurance technologies. We've also been able to share knowledge with the International Working Group on Age Verification. We've also gained valuable enforcement experience in this area through launching an enforcement program looking at some of the smaller adult VSPs. This is focused on whether these VSPs have sufficiently robust age assurance in place to protect under 18s, and this is still ongoing. But it's not just the smaller VSPs. The UK's largest VSP, OnlyFans, has actually implemented age assurance for all its UK users, following a successful supervisory relationship with Ofcom. And the Online Safety Act, now that it's come in, will supersede the VSP regime, but this will be over a transition period. So the existing VSPs will remain subject to VSP regime, while the newer VSPs will be subject to online safety. And once the government launches transition period, they will also all move over. So as well as the video sharing platform regime, we've also been preparing for online safety by building a world-class online safety group. We've recruited over 350 roles from across tech platforms, law enforcement, civil society, academia, and many other areas, including a few former ICO colleagues. So this means that our age assurance team isn't just made up of policy professionals. It's actually hugely cross-functional, whether that's the AI experts and the digital identity experts who help to inform our policy, 
or the supervision and enforcement colleagues who will help our policy to achieve its objectives. And it's not just within Ofcom that we're collaborating. We know that age assurance is controversial and data protection and privacy often come up in our user attitudes research as things that users are worried about. Now, Wayling's going to talk even more about this, but we've worked really closely with the ICO to ensure that our approach takes full account of the data protection requirements and the impact of our proposals on users' privacy. We've pursued external joint research together and will continue to do so. And Wei Ling will hopefully talk to us more about the ACCS research and the research into families' attitudes that we've done together. We also recently presented together at the Stanford Trust and Safety Research Conference and we'll continue to pursue opportunities for joint outreach and engagement. We're also very aware that having two regulators with different remits operating in the same space can be confusing. And so we're committed to speaking the same regulatory language. One of the ways that we're doing this is by giving each other sight of our policy positions early on and reviewing each other's documents early on to try and enable regulat regulatory alignment where possible while retaining our position as independent regulators. So where does age assurance come in in the Online Safety Act? It's actually mentioned in two parts. So in part three, which applies to user to user services, there is a duty for these services to prevent children from encountering primary priority content by using age verification and or age estimation. And primary priority content in this case refers to porn pornography or self-harm, suicide or eating disorder content. Part five applies to provider pornographic content. And this is where this content is published or displayed by the provider of the service rather than by a user. So there's similar requirements here that are worded slightly differently in that the service providers must use age verification and or age estimation to ensure that children are not normally able to encounter this content. So there are also some record keeping duties here. So part five providers must keep a written record, including of how they have had regard to user privacy when implementing age assurance. So in both cases, the act sets a relatively high bar around the age assurance that's required. So it must be highly effective at correctly determining whether or not a particular user is a child. So Ofcom is required to publish guidance for providers for part five, and will also be setting codes of practice for primary priority content under part three. And we'll do this through a consultation based approach. So these are the two absolute requirements for age assurance in the act, but there are also some instances where age assurance is suggested as something that services could do to protect children from other harms. And this comes under part three of the act. In the meantime, we're also keen to establish ourselves as a thought leader in this space. And to answer some of the questions here, we will be pursuing internal and external research, including public, including iterative research into public attitudes towards aid assurance. So last year, for example, we commissioned Yonder Consulting to explore adult users' attitudes to age verification on porn sites. The VSP regime has also been really helpful here as we've been able to use our information gathering powers to learn more about how OnlyFans is using age assurance on its platform. So what can you expect from us in this space? So in December, we will be publishing the part five guidance consultation for provider pornographic content. And this will look at the age assurance and record keeping duties. So this will be open for a 12 week consultation and we encourage all of today's attendees to share their views via the consultation response. You can also sign up to alerts on the Ofcom website if you're interested in being alerted when these are released. In spring 2024, we'll be publishing our broader protection of children consultation and this will include the draft codes of practice for age assurance for primary priority content. We'll, we will then review the responses to both of these consultations and we'll publish final statements at later dates, although these are yet to be confirmed. It's worth noting that for both consultations, we will be taking a approach to age assurance that takes into account human rights, in particular, freedom of expression and the rights to privacy. 
As well as this, we'll be taking into account our duties under the Equality Act. So to sum up on the next steps for Ofcom and the ICO, we'll continue to co consult on our separate regulatory products, as well as continuing to collaborate with each other and with other regulators, in particular through the DRCF. We'll continue to build our evidence base through external research, as well as utilising the expertise of our in-house tech team to ensure that we're making well-informed policy in this area. We'll also continue to share knowledge with the International Working Group on Age Assurance and other international bodies as part of efforts to establish a common evidence base and best practice. So that's all for me that I had prepared. So I will hand back over. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can I just ask quick, you mentioned the Equalities Act. What, how does that impinge upon this particular area? So we are required to ensure that um, any policy that we make doesn't negatively impact on people with protected characteristics. So in determining what approach we take to age assurance, we need to make sure that we are not recommending an approach that will, for instance, discriminate against um, certain groups of people. So one sort of practical example, for instance, is some age assurance um, methods might risk um, discriminating against people of certain ethnicities, for example, if they have a lower sort of technical accuracy rate for um, that group. So it's about taking that into consideration um, when we're developing our approach. And on, on, and in the other direction, for example, the protection of women's rights and the equality agenda insofar as that exists, that's not part of the remake, it's simply in relation to the technical aspects of age assurance. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. Right.